I've been working on a video, how and when to use certain wood turning tools. Well, that video started approaching 40 minutes long and I thought I need to just break this up into part one and part two. So today I'm gonna to show you uh, how and when to use wood turning tools in your shop, part one. And I'll publish part two in about a week. Now, maybe one of the most frequently asked questions I get in my shop is, when do you use a particular tool in a given situation? So today I'm gonna to go through some of the tools I've organized in my shop, and I'm gonna go through them one by one and give you examples of when you might use a particular tool in a given situation. Sometimes you shouldn't use a tool like a spindle roughing gouge in cross grain work. That can be dangerous, can give you a really bad catch and an accident. Now in this video, I'm gonna show you examples of cutting with an array of wood turning tools. The first thing we need to do is take a look at some terms and define them. For example, spindle turnings or center work is between centers. And as you can see, the grain runs parallel with the bedways. Here's an example of a cross grain turning. This could be a plate or a platter or a shallow bowl. And this is side grain. And the orientation would be this way in the lay. Then I'll check this up and show you some tools we might use to cut with this. The white lines indicate the grain running this way. But if we turn it here, it's a cross grain turning. Okay, let's uh, readjust the camera and we'll take a look at some fine points for defining these two terms. All right, you are looking at a very out of balance rough turn bowl. So I'm gonna work on the spigot or the tenon first. Now, a confusing bit of information, if you will, is I can use a bowl gouge to form this tenon, and I can also use a spindle gouge. Okay, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with using a spindle gouge on a bowl in certain situations. But let me start with my bowl gouge. And this is a half inch bowl gouge with a swept back grind on it. All right, so that tenon is pretty good. I could just use that and put that into my chuck jaws. Let me get a spindle gouge and I'll show you the same thing. All right, now here's a spindle gouge, okay? And one important aspect of either one of these tools, I've got a 40 degree angle on the nose, okay? It's uh, pretty sharp or steep, and I'm gonna go in there and form this tenon and because of the nose angle, it's a little bit easier to form that tenon. And what I like to do is go in from this direction and then go in from this direction. And I'm turning right at 850 RPM. So there you go. That's a good example of when you can use a bowl gouge and a spindle gouge on that tenon. Now while I'm in this position, I'm going to take uh, a second and just go over the outside of this bowl with another bowl gouge. I probably won't use a spindle gouge on this, but let's just see uh, what a bowl gouge is going to do to clean this surface up. It's really, really out of balance. Okay, now I've gone to a 5 8 inch 
bowl gouge. All right, and I'm going to clean up the outside of this bowl, round it over so I can reverse chuck this, so I can put this bowl in my chuck jaws. Now it's difficult to make a push cut on this down low on that bowl because my, my tail stock is in the way. But I think right about here, I can start making a good push cut and go all the way around that bowl on the outside. Need to adjust my tool rest just a little bit. A little bit more speed. All right, now I took a very slow traverse and I've got a lot of tool marks on there that I can deal with, but I've leveled off that surface for the most part. All right. A little bit of a shear scrape down here and a push cut up here cleaned up that surface very well. Now, there's a bowl gouge, but here's a situation where you might use a spindle gouge on the outside of this bowl. I'm going to go back to my spindle gouge and I'm going to put some beads on the outside of this bowl as a decoration. And and a bowl gouge may be a little bit too big of a tool. A spindle gouge may be more appropriate for doing something like this. All right, well, all right, so I may not be Richard Raffin, but that's not too bad. And you get the idea that I can make some beads on there, and I really like that grain, the way it uh, is undulating, if you will. All right, I'm going to spray a little bit of solvent on this to uh, bring out the grain show off my beads. Not too bad. And that's a great example of using a spindle gouge on cross grain work. Nothing wrong with that. Now I just took this uh, little piece of hard maple. It's a spindle turning. I took it down to round with my spindle roughing gouge. And to me, this is one of the most uh, versatile tools you'll have in your shop. Okay, you never use this on cross grain work. And I'm going to repeat that about 20 times during this video. Very, very important. Uh, it's got a weak area right here called a tang. And if you get a catch in end grain, that can be very dangerous. So. Here I'm using this in a spindle orientation, going this way, but if I come in here into the end grain, I'm gonna have a catch, and it's gonna be bad, and I could break that tool and hurt myself. 
Let me readjust the camera and I'll show you a couple other examples of how I might use this tool. Now let's take a look at the spindle roughing gouge from the end view of my camera. All right, with the lathe turned off, we can see that this tool is really good with peeling. And if I hold this tool flat like this, this wing right here, as well as this wing, are relatively straight. And I can get a nice leveling cut if I hold that tool almost perpendicular to the work and with the flute just about closed. And it really does a very nice job of peeling. I'll turn the lathe on, turn the lathe way down. And there we go. Now, that's not a very good cut, okay? Because a lot of that cutting edge is hitting the wood, but it does a nice job of leveling that off. I call that a leveling cut. Now, let me compare this tool to the skew chisel. Here are two tools, the skew chisel and a spindle roughing gouge that can really get you in trouble in wood turning. And I would compare the two in the respect that you should never use this tool in a cutting orientation going into cross grain work. Okay, here I'm just peeling wood, just like I was with the uh, spindle roughing gouge. Let me clean this, this area up. Now throughout this video, I'm going to use a term, cutting orientation. And if I hold this tool with the handle low, like this, it's in a cutting orientation. Now, I've got the lathe speed turned way down. And here I'm just rubbing the heel. I'm not cutting. All right. And if I raise the handle up, the bevel is still rubbing the wood, and that's a proper cut. And that's a peeling cut. Pretty much like the spindle roughing gouge, it's really good for uh, peeling wood. I'm gonna turn my lathe off. All right, I've got the camera zoomed in a little bit. Let me put my skew chisel back up here. Rotate the lathe by hand. And you'll see the shavings I'm getting from that. Peeling the wood, and again, this is not the greatest cut in the world. I'm not getting a very good surface because a lot of that cutting edge is contacting the wood. Now, if I hold this more in a, a skewed presentation or a shearing presentation, that cutting edge is not quite up and down, but, but just about up and down. So let me... Uh, let me rotate the, the lathe by hand and we'll see what we get off this. All right, right there is a really, really good example. In some of the previous cuts, I was getting, in some of the previous cuts, I was getting something more like that, a really flat, broad shaving. Here, with that skew chisel in a shearing orientation, I'm getting a spiral in a much, much cleaner cut. So that's uh, something more to do with how we present that tool to a piece of wood. But again, this is side grain right here. Okay, does really well. This is end grain. And if I hold that tool 
in a cutting orientation, in other words, the handle is down, I'm gonna get a heck of a catch. If I wanna form a tendon on the end of this, All right, now that's, uh, that's really a cut. I have my tool rest adjusted perpendicular to the bedways, and I'm gonna use a smaller skew chisel to give you an example of when you might use this in end grain. Now, please, please listen carefully. I'm not gonna use this in a cutting orientation. I'm gonna hold this level right here all right, parallel with the ground or the floor, and I can fine tune my, my tenon this way. It's not cutting, it's scraping. And this is really important. All right, I was going into end grain but I was scraping and I can kind of fine tune my, my spigot or my tenon that way. Be careful. Okay, this is end grain and I don't know if you can see it, this end grain is really, really torn. All right, <laughs> that's a characteristic of air, end grain. Yeah, all right, let's move on. While I'm in this orientation with the end view of this uh, spindle turning, I'm gonna show you a couple other tools. And if you look at the cross section of this beading and parting tool, all right, it's really a little bit like a skew chisel. So here's my, my skew chisel, all right. Two bevels, ordinarily used in a cutting orientation. And here is a beading and parting tool. And please notice the similarities between those two tools. The skew chisel is wider. The beading and parting tool is more narrow in cross section this way, but the beading and parting tool has two bevels and can be used for detailing. Ordinarily, this tool is not really used for parting because it just takes off too much wood. Here is a typical narrow parting tool. And ordinarily, it's best used in a cutting orientation with the handle down like this. So let's see how each one of these parting tools works. All right, now I can just continue where that uh, tenon is with my beading and parting tool. And this is a good tool for, for forming a tenon. Okay, cutting orientation, I'm rubbing the bevel, raise the handle till it starts cutting. Now I need to make the point this is best used in a spindle where you're peeling like this, not in end grain. Although you might use this in a, a scraping orientation, but uh, you know, let's not focus on that. And if you're a new wood turner, you may not really do that. All right, now let's take a look at this very nice narrow parting tool. This is a D-way parting tool. Nice Macassar ebony handle. And again, this is used best in a cutting orientation with the handle trailing down. Let's turn this on. All right, I had to go to my grinder just a little bit. Okay, let me show you one more cut from this 
view of my camera. And I'm just kind of playing around here. I'm having fun. This is a marvelous tool. We'll make one more parting cut. All right. Now, we might make some sort of a artistic piece doing that. Okay. But ordinarily, this tool is best used to uh, to part a piece of wood in two. All right, if I want to take this in the center and just cut it in two, I can do that. Uh, let's do one more thing just for the heck of it and see how this works. All right, so if you were in need of a little ring like that, That'll work. All right, let's move on to another tool. Now, as I make this video, I keep discovering certain exceptions. Well, you can use this tool in cross grain, but you can also use it in end grain. Well, I'm not going to include every little exception that I run across. I am going to put up in the description a PDF file, a list of tools and when you might use them but it's very general. It's a general list of guidelines. All right. Spindle gouge, spindle roughing gouge, skew chisel, parting tools, a narrow parting tool, a beating and parting tool. Uh, I'm not going to get into specialty tools because this could be a, a 10 part video series on turning tools and when to use them as a general guide. And mostly if you're an experienced wood turner, you know when to use certain tools and when not to use certain tools. If you're a beginner and you're not sure, ask somebody. I've got my phone number on this. I'd rather have you call me and ask a question about using a particular tool or doing a particular operation. I don't want you to get hurt, especially if you're a new wood turner. If you're an experienced wood turner, maybe you can help somebody who is just beginning. Anyway, let's move forward.